France, April 1429. For six months, English forces had besieged Orleans, the final city to resist their advance. After 90 years of war, all France was at last within their grasp. Then out of nowhere, a figure emerged from the French side. It was a young woman in full armor, a peasant girl who would turn the tide of war and lead her troops to victory. She was a girl who fought as a man, a holy warrior who was burned alive as a heretic, and a heroine who lives on forever as a saint. Joan was born and died in flames. Jahan, as her family called her. She came into this world in 1412 amongst the chaos of the Hundred Years' War, a time of endless rage and turmoil for peasant farmers like Joan's family. Her father may have been the mayor in the village of Domremy, but it didn't save Joan from the horrors of war. Joan grew up here in the east of France. This peaceful countryside was aflame with a war that had raged for decades. The Hundred Years' War had become a French civil war between the Armagnacs and the Burgundians. The English took full advantage of this turmoil by allying with the Burgundians in an attempt to conquer all of France. After the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, they won a huge chunk of northern France. By 1420, the English king, Henry V, was even making a claim to the French throne. Those like Joan's family, who supported the Armagnac Dauphin, the true heir to the French crown, were desperate. How would they stop their enemies? Who would save France? At the age of 13, something very odd happened to Joan. Hearing the church bells ringing, she saw a light coming from her left, a light that spoke to her with a clear message from God. Save France from the English and see the Dauphin, the French prince, crowned king. This strange event would change Joan forever. In fact, it would change the course of European history. On her own account, Joan had an extremely important experience, a kind of rapture. And it, it becomes for her the sort of center of her personality, that she had been chosen and spoken to in this way. We know that puberty is a time of unpredictable rushes of hormones, coupled with a questioning of self. And in Joan's case, her adolescence, her puberty, was particularly traumatic. And these elements could easily combine to allow her to experience visions, hallucinations. The more Joan's voices returned to her, the more fanatical she became about saving France by driving out the English. Her parents were so angry with her that her father asked her brothers to drown her if she went off to join the campaign against the English, if she went to join the soldiers. He probably, of course, had ideas about what joining soldiers, camp followers, meant. But um, at the same time, she was certainly in rebellion from her early, uh, early youth. By 17, Joan's obsession had become so strong that she went against her family's wishes and stormed in to see the local lord, Robert de Baudricourt. She would convince him to help her meet the Dauphin, if he liked it or not. I have to see the king, even if I have to walk until my feet are worn down to my knees. There is no one, king, duke or daughter of the king of Scotland. No one can recover the kingdom of France but me. I would prefer to stay home and spin wool with my mother, for this is not my proper station. But I must do it, because my Lord God wills it. See? <laughs> to most people, Joan must have seemed insane. 
Little did they know that she had the power to change their lives. Driven by her voices, 17-year-old Joan gambled everything on getting the local lord's support to see the Dauphin. At first, Baudricourt threw Joan out and advised her father to give her a good beating. But Joan came back again and again. Baudricourt finally accepted and helped Joan because he was supported and advised to do so by a faction at the court of the Dauphin. They wanted to encourage the Dauphin to take an active martial role against the Burgundians, not to try to negotiate for peace, but to fight. And Joan of Arc offered to lead the French to encourage them in exactly that situation. Joan got Baudricourt's backing. She traveled with six soldiers to go and see the Dauphin. To do this, she dressed up as a man. Joan underwent her first transformation. Today, we're used to the tomboy look, but in Joan's day, it was a really shocking thing to do. By cutting her hair, Joan challenged the rules of society and religion. Many theologians were anxious because the Bible explicitly said that men should wear men's clothes, women should wear women's clothes. St. Paul, in particular, made that statement. And so, therefore, there was a great debate about uh, the right of this woman to dress up as a man. The point about Joan of Arc's dressing as a man is that she never pretended to be a man. She was always la pucelle, she was always the maid. She held the fact that her voices had told her to dress as a man, but it makes her more angelic. It turns her into a kind of third sex creature. Joan broke the rules and got away with it. But would this fiery angel succeed in crowning her king? Joan was off to see the Dauphin. Riding for 11 days and nights on horseback is no easy feat. You get very, very sore. She was a young girl riding with an escort of six rough soldiers through enemy territory. They could be slaughtered at any minute. It took a lot of courage for a girl of just 17. Joan's fame spread like a bushfire fueled by rumors and myth. But the stories reached the court of the Dauphin long before she did, here at Chinon Castle in late February, 1429. There was the preceding myth of the um, maid who would emerge from the wood and be a warrior. And I think when Joan emerged from the wood, donned soldiers' clothing, she was well aware that she more closely fitted the image of that warrior maiden. And Joan was a peasant. She came from a peasant background. She understood the working of the peasant mind. She knew what would impress. She was accepted by the French as an angel, a divine messenger. In those days, people were extremely religious, but it was a religion mixed with a high degree of superstition. Joan entered the Dauphin's court in this very room nearly 600 years ago. The court was cynical and demoralized, drained by years of civil war. They were suspicious of any newcomer. They decided to play a trick on her. If indeed she was sent by God, then she should be able to pick out the Dauphin by herself. They weren't just taunting her, they were testing her. God give you life, gentle king. 